Welcome to the Seat Go Create podcast. This is Tim Winders, your host. I'm a coach for business owners, executives, and leaders. My wife and I consider ourselves nomads, and we currently travel, live, and work in our 39-foot RV. It's kind of odd today that I'm actually in a physical home. We are visiting our parents just outside of Atlanta, and let me tell you what, the ground is good and solid, but uh, boy, I wish I could get back in the RV and hit the road. My wife and I were just talking about that this morning, so... But uh, I am recording, not in the RV. I usually say my portion is recorded in the passenger seat in my office, but I'm not right now. I'm kind of missing it. One thing that I would like to encourage everyone to do that's listening in, make sure that you listen to the end of the podcast. First of all, we're going to be talking about a lot of great things. This is going to be a fascinating interview. I'm looking forward to it. Make sure you listen to the end, though, because at the end, I'll include ways that you can continue this conversation in various capacities and we would love for you to do that this is something that we just want to continue discussing and talking about and when we get to the topic i think you're gonna you're gonna realize that you definitely want to do that today our guest is gabrielle Bochet, and man I'm, I'm excited about this i get to do research on on guests and a couple of days ago when i was researching i was just saying wow this is going to be a lot of fun i don't think it'll be confrontational but we kind of had a chat before we clicked record that we're going to possibly have a good mature conversation because uh, her and her husband, Brian, they've been called next generation's motivational titans. Man, that's a big, big word right there. They're best-selling authors, international speakers, and together they founded The Purpose Company. Brian and Gabrielle have personally worked with celebrities, United States military officials, presidential campaigns, and Fortune 500 companies. Gabrielle, welcome to the Seat Go Create podcast. Hey, thanks for having me, Tim. I'm excited. Yeah, I'm glad you're here. Now, Now, before we kind of go diving deep in, my first question I like to ask is kind of your elevator pitch. I can, and really you, I could have gone over so many of your, your accolades and your bio, but why don't you just briefly tell our audience, we're, you and I are on an elevator, if we can get on one right now. What do you do? Yeah, what you could hear through my mask. Uh, I help people discover their exact purpose and then use it to find extreme clarity in their life, their work, and their community. I help people go from kind of confused, stuck in place to discover that their life not only has meaning, but that they can discover their purpose and use it to feel crazy, incredible fulfillment, no matter who they are, how old they are, or what they're currently doing. Wow. And that's not the first time you've said that, I'm guessing. Just made it up right now. <laughs> I was going to say, wow, no, no, no. I mean, you, you, you have, there's a word you use. It's one of my favorite words called clarity. And uh, you don't just roll out of bed and, and gain clarity. That, that's something that can be developed over time. Is that correct? Absolutely. And, and clarity is one of those things that I think in our world and our society we're looking for. But I don't think a lot of us know how to find it. I think that clarity means for some people that they know what that next step is. Clarity for others means that they know what the next 10 years looks like. Mm -hmm. But I think in a society, in a world where we're looking for instant answers, where we're asking Google or Siri or um, in our house, it's she who will not be named, which is Alexa. So she doesn't listen in on or start responding to to something. Um, We have constant access to information but that doesn't mean we have constant access to wisdom. And so clarity is really that pathway that you know what that next step is, that you know with complete confidence that you're going in the right direction and you spend your effort and your energy moving forward versus looking to the left and right, comparing, being confused, or frankly, just staying stuck in place. Right. Um, All right. So I had a few light kind of get to know each other questions but it's almost like we peeled away something deep that I'm, I'm, I'm Tim, I go real deep, real fast. I can't help it. I try real hard. I do too. And but... It's how, I, it's how you and I, it's like, we're, we're instant friends, man. We gotta, Gosh. gotta just dump in the, the deep end, but we can do fun and silly. We can do, no. you know, deep and intense, or we can just go back and forth. No. You're driving. Let's jump back and forth then, because one of the things that bothers me quite a bit as, as with what I do and, 
and sounds like you do the same. One of the things I tell people I do is I reach inside people and I pull out the greatness that's already there, which a lot of that has to do with clarity and purpose and things also. If you were to guess, and this is a total guess because I don't think there's data on this, how many people do we bump into that struggle with their purpose and clarity in the world? Yeah, I, I believe about 95% of the population does not know their purpose. Mm. I think, I think maybe 5% have clarity about their purpose and how to use it. And I, I think a, a very small percentage of people, maybe 2% are actually walking in their purpose currently mm. because there's, there's a difference between knowing your purpose and using it. Mm. If you know your purpose and you're not using it, it's agonizing. Every day you wake up and you know that you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. You yeah. um, can get bitter on uh, worse or, you know, get kind of live in the clouds at best that you're right. not really walking in the person that you know that you're called to be and you're not living in, at that, that full potential. But I think such a small percentage of people aren't really walking in, in their purpose. And I think part of that is, I think we have a wrong definition of purpose. I think a lot of us think that purpose is some fluffy thing that you find on a retreat or in a moment or, you know, in the shower or after a breakup or something. And, and there hasn't been a, a system to be able to get that clarity and finding your purpose really un, uh, until now. And, and that's really what my husband and I, Brian and I have been spending the last seven years doing is creating a system, developing it, testing it, using it with our clients, working with Fortune 500 folks in the U.S. military and some, some pretty cool people to create a system that you can not only get clarity about who you are, but get clarity about what you should do. Yeah, excellent. All right, so now what I'm going to do is you've set us up for the purpose factor and for that discussion but I'm going to tell the listener that they're going to have to let us chat for a little while. And we're going to get to that in a moment. How about that? <laughs> yes. How about that? All right. So we're in a, we're in such a weird time, Gabrielle, that we are coming out of, or still in, depending on when people listen to this variations of, lockdown, there's stress and strain with, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, we've had riots <laughs> over the summer. We've had just a lot of things going on. I like to ask this question. I think right before we clicked record, you said you, you, you've kind of moved to a new location. I just like to ask, how are y'all doing? Is everyone safe? Is everyone well, healthy? And how are you coming through the current situations that we're seeing in the world? And answer it however you would like to. Yeah, no, great, great question. Um, I oftentimes joke around that when we're jumping on Zoom calls or meetings, everyone's like, we kind of like start off like everyone's players on the Oregon Trail, total millennial joke, but it's like, you know, how are you doing? How's your family? Do you have rations for the week? Like everyone's trying to make sure that everyone's going to make it through all this, uh, through all this. Um, but it, it's been a pretty incredible um, opportunity. And I, and I say opportunity because going into this, my husband and I really knew that um, this season where um, people are working from home, not traveling as much. I know I travel a ton, you travel a ton. It's shifted our routines, but we knew going into this that it was either going to be a gift or it was going to be a crisis. Mm. And how we reacted to it was completely up to us. We could look at it as, oh my goodness, everything's out of control. I just want to get back to normal, whatever normal is. I, I'm not quite sure what we're doing. And I could be in this reaction cycle of waiting for life to return to what I feel comfortable with. Or I could recognize that this is a shift and I could see it as an opportunity to be able to spend more time either, you know, working on our relationships, uh, spend more time on our books, spend more time on our company or our products. And in the midst of this, I mean, we've, our company is, is, has just exploded because mm -hmm. we've spent so much time really investing in our clients and our products and in our programs because we've had the blank space that before we were all so mm -hmm. busy. 
you know, Tim, like before uh, being busy was, was like a currency. Like how busy are you? Oh my gosh, I'm so busy. How busy are you? Oh, I'm way busier than you. It, it was complete nonsense. And now I think that this whole season has really reset people's priorities to show what is really most important to you. Is it your career? Is it finances? Is it stability? Is it opportunity? Is it relationships? What you're missing the most, I think, is a mirror of what you prioritize the most. And so I think for some folks, they're having some of these deeper life questions of, have I been putting the right things at the forefront of my time and my effort? And for others, I think it's been given them kind of some of that, that white space to be able to go deeper on the things that they've maybe had a back burner because of uh, some of life's priorities that keep popping up in the way. Yeah, that's, and that's great because it kind of goes back to the clarity that we discussed right when we started. You know, a lot of people, when there's a lot of stuff going on, it's, there's just a lot of distractions, but you know, I, we've talked about this on the podcast with other guests. We haven't had sports. We haven't had entertainment. We haven't had amusement parks and you know, whatever we could go through a lot of stuff. There have been distractions for those that are still looking for them, but there's not as many out there. So what a, what a great response. I appreciate you saying that. I know that that will encourage encourage people. So, and, and a couple of things you brought up, I want to drill down a little bit more because I think there's lessons here. Uh, you two, y'all started a company this year, correct? Right. Yep. And, 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 and I think I saw where it was in January of this year. Doesn't that seem like it was so long ago now? <laughs> I know 10 years ago or January, it, yeah. it feels, uh, it, it feels about the same, but yeah, going into it, um, together, Brian and I have been running, um, our, our company, our first company, the millennial solution that I started back in my early twenties, helping organizations understand the next generation and as we were working together, we were working with all these major brands coming in and, and working with a team and they're all wanting to know, you know what's wrong with millennials, right? the million dollar question. Really, it's the billion dollar question. Yeah. And as we were working with these organizations, we were recognizing it wasn't a millennial issue. It was a significance issue. Millennials were just more likely than other generations to say, I'm quitting because I don't feel fulfilled or I don't want to buy your product because I don't believe in your values. Millennials were pursuing purpose, they were just using different words and going about it in a different way. But as we started working with these major companies on attraction, retention, and marketing for the next generation, we recognized that there was a huge theme and it all came back to purpose. So we started developing this purpose discovery system, started testing it out, started developing it, and ended up finding out that it wasn't a millennial issue. It was a purpose issue. And every single person on this planet wants to know their purpose. Yeah, that's good. You, you mentioned the word significance. And one of the things I wanted to do is ask, why is that? Is it, and I know you mentioned that everyone on the planet is looking for it, but I, I did actually, because of your background with, uh, with that generation, I did want to hopefully shed some light for myself and maybe others about some, maybe some value and then also some misunderstandings that could be there. But why I'm 56. I don't have a problem saying it. I'm not going to ask you how old you are, but I'm 56 and I know you're in that generation. Why is it not, or has it not seemed as important for people maybe in my age group? I'm the tail end of baby boomers, just so you know. Um, I came home to the hospital being born the day JFK was shot. So you'll know exactly when, wow. when that was. Yeah, very significant. Every generation that was has... about two blocks from where I'm sitting right now. Yeah, I'm right downtown oh, Dallas. <laughs> wow, interesting there. So, but why is significance so important to, let's stay with the millennials right now. I think it's important to everyone, but, but you brought it up specifically as a key value for that generation. Why? Absolutely. This is a, a generation, the millennial generation, who has been raised from a very young age to do anything that we want and be anything that we want. We were raised by very encouraging, very well-meaning, very optimistic parents who really encouraged us to find careers that we found, found fulfillment in. But we are a generation that came through the recession, many of us overeducated and underemployed, looking for those jobs that paid maybe more than, than 
was reasonable or, or realistic. And so we came into the job force with different expectations for what the, the workforce was willing to, to pay us. And so we've got a generation coming in wanting to find meaning and fulfillment at an earlier age. I oftentimes tell the story when I'm speaking about how, and I've worked with the military for a number of years, and I was working with, with one commander as I was explaining how millennials want to feel fulfilled. He looked at me, scratched his face, and he said, fulfilled? Why don't they just go fulfill my coffee? I was like, oh my goodness, sir. But for him and his perspective, you don't deserve to be fulfilled until you're middle-aged, until you quote unquote earn it. And so we have a younger generation saying, well, why shouldn't I love what I do? And we have an older generation saying, well, because you're 19. That's probably why. So it's, uh, it's a difference of, of the role of work as well. Whereas older generations were raised with a very clear differentiation between work and personal life. You don't love your job. Well, great. Get a hobby or get a girlfriend because mm -hmm. that's just how life works. That's not how this generation is. We were grazed where we have access not only to information, but access to a competitive job market where we can be sitting at your desk on Monday and then have a job by Tuesday afternoon somewhere else, all because of the global workforce that we're currently working in. So it's a, it's a very different world that the younger generation is raised in coming into a workforce with an expectation that not only is our opinion going to matter because we were raised by very democratic parents who wanted to know, you know, what we thought about things. My parents' generation, probably your parents' generation didn't really care what you thought about anything. It's like, you know, sit in the back and we're going on vacation where mom and dad want to go. Not, oh, you don't, you know, you don't like this color car. Great. Well, we'll switch out and get another car for you. So the, the way that this generation was raised has certainly uh, influenced the way that we're coming into the workforce and expecting to be seen, heard, and, and employed in, in today's workforce. Yeah, and it's, it's one of the things because probably, see, I've, I, my children are 29 and 26, so they are in that category also. And my wife and I have had this discussion quite a bit, and that is, did we make it too easy for our children? Did we make it too hard for them? We really rarely think that. But, but every generation has significant events that impact them. Mm -hmm. And on this podcast, I've talked a good bit, a good bit about it. We, we had some successful businesses, lived in a resort community during our children's teen years. And those businesses were all in real estate, just kind of to fill in some gaps, if you don't know. And so, oh, eight, nine, 10, et cetera, were very challenging. And by the time a few years later, all around, we were pseudo homeless nomads, we call it. Things are going great now, but there were some tough times in that. And our children were probably at very formative years then. I think I read somewhere that you came out of college like, oh, nine, what great timing. Um, I'm going to, this is a two part question, but first question, how did, that economic situation impact that generation? Significantly. So there was a study done a number of years ago where they looked at the core events that most shaped a generation. And that's typically, there are a couple things for, you know, uh, birth years and things like that influence what makes a generation. But what really makes a generation are those formative events that happen mm -hmm. when that generation is between 10 and 20 years old. And so for this generation, it used to be 9-11. Then as this study started looking at how this generation was formed, what they actually found about five years ago, millennials stopped saying 9-11 was the most formative event. They started to say the rise of technology. Now we're certainly going to see this younger generation, Generation Z, certainly going to see COVID and, and what we're living through currently. But what the economic recession did for my generation is it completely reset our expectations of our role in the marketplace. I mean, can you imagine what it, life would actually look like if this generation loved them dearly, but if we came out saying, I can do anything I want and be anything that I want and graduate from college and be making that sixty, hundred, one hundred and fifty thousand dollars $150,000 we thought we deserved, Thank goodness that the economy was saying, no, actually, you're going to start at the bottom, or I'm so glad you spent four years in college or eight years going to school, but you're going to have to reset as a barista or as an assistant. And so I think it really helped us reset 
and ask some of life's biggest questions. Older generations can oftentimes criticize my generation because we had what I lovingly refer to as the quarter life crisis. We're hitting 24, 25 saying, I don't want to do this forever. And our parents are like, well, that's how it works. It's called a job. <laughs> like, I don't know. I, I, this isn't for me. And so they're taking gap years and traveling and switching jobs every few months. But I, I think that that has really shaped the way that we see the role of work, where we're saying, why would I sacrifice my life, my freedom, and my love for a job that could just let me go because the economy is bad? So I, I think the role of employer has certainly changed because millennials are coming in and aren't necessarily as trusting and aren't necessarily as dependent upon their current employer to make sure that they can maintain their lifestyle. So what was interesting about it is that I came out of uh, Georgia Tech in 1987, 88. Anyway, don't chuckle, don't laugh. But we were already being told then, don't expect to go work someplace and work there the rest of your life. But yet there were still people coming out with that, that programming, you could tell. And I graduated from college with people that did. Now I worked two, I had my own business when I was in college. And then I worked two weeks corporate and I was looking for a way to get out of it. Nine years later, I was able to break away and all that. So, but, but there are these entrenched paradigms that appear to be in generations. And one of the things I'm all, I'm kind of getting out of my order that I had on some notes, but that always happens. So don't be alarmed. Um, one of the things I'm always fascinated with is, and we're going to get to it later when we talk about success because it's purpose and things like that. That's related to the book that we'll talk about in a moment, but it also relates to our views of material possessions and money and other things like that. Can you, can you educate us about what you've seen related to that? Because obviously in the, in a financial downturn, it changes a lot of things versus a very uptime. My formative years were the eighties and you don't recall the eighties cause you didn't exist then, but the eighties were go, go, go. And the best example is that Gordon Gecko movie on wall street, which is greed is good. And so that was very formative to many of us. And some of us have had to purge that, but what are some of the, some of those paradigms or thought processes related to money? And uh, I'm not really looking for the purpose thing. We're going to talk about that in a moment. I'm looking for possessions. Mm -hmm. I, I think that there's certainly been a reset. And I think that millennials have really helped lead the charge in that. Whereas even until 10 years ago, I think that there was a different kind of um, role that even companies played, where they were selling things in a much more transactional type way. Whereas now I think that companies, their role is much more transformational, not only as an employer, but for the consumer market as well. So when I buy a product, it's not just I'm buying a product to satisfy a need. It's what does this product say about me? Because now we have a generation that is taking photos of it, sharing it, recommending it to mm -hmm. other people. 90% of millennial moms share a review or a product suggestion on social media every single week. So if you're marketing and you want to figure out how to get to millennials, go after millennial moms, little tidbit there. We, we have a generation who wants to share their experiences, their thoughts, and their priorities with the world. And so I think that certainly shifted things. We have a generation that kind of came out of this recession where now we see trends like minimalism coming up, tiny homes coming up where we have a generation that was raised by parents, mostly baby boomers, who did have that greed is good mindset, where it was, you haven't made it till you have the, the house, the boat, the houseboat, the pool, everything. It was, what do you have that is in a possession form that reflects your actual success? But my generation, as you look at generations like I have for the last 15, it's almost 16 years now, you see that generations either replicate or rebel those that, um, those that raised them. So my generation, millennials, are rebelling against some of that materialism of our parents. We don't need to own the boat. We can rent it. We don't need to own the vacation home. We can have access to it through something like an Airbnb. We have tool shares and clothing shares, and it's a completely different economy because of the shared economy where millennials are coming in and saying, just because I 
own that doesn't mean that it says anything about me. I care more about access than ownership. Hmm. That's a big, that, that's huge right there. Access over ownership, because you're correct. Our generation was always, always about accumulation. And not only could we fill up one house, but let's go ahead and get another one. Let's get a few storage units and, and keep going. And then, and then when my generation starts getting rid of things, we look at our children and we say, Hey, do you want, 12 sets of China and they go, we don't want any of them. We don't want any of that. So, and, and listen, that's the lifestyle that my wife and I lead. And that is very minimalist. We actually call it essentialist. We just, mm -hmm. we really deal with the things that we need and that's it. And, and literally our office home, everything is mobile. And so it allows us flexibility, which is, which is really cool. Um, I, I wanted to do, we're kind of on the, generational thing, which I think has some value because I, I really wanted to tap into some of your expertise, even though I know, I know I want to get to purpose, but I want, I can't get off of this because of a couple of reasons. We are in such an identity world, Gabrielle, that everyone wants to, not everyone, it seems as if media and others wants to group people in these segmented groups and it creates so much conflict. I personally believe there's more similarities with people and that's where we're going to get to purpose. That's I'm, I'm, I'm keeping the listener holding on for the secret sauce at the end. However, everything in our society has a tendency to try to group us up, male, female, old, young, wealthy, not wealthy, color, all of these things. And so I do think it's important to understand. And I think you and I can have a little bit of fun with this. I'm going to play for a little while, old dude. <laughs> and I'm going to, I'm going to hit you with a few things and I'm going to try to be nice about it. And some of this is not the way I think, but I'm going to kind of play a little bit with it. You're just but, saying that because you have an RV. So. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe so. And, and I am, I, I mentioned to someone, be careful how you answer this. I mentioned to someone recently I said, yeah, it's kind of tough being middle-aged. And they said, you're 56, you're not middle-aged. I'm going, what? I'm middle-aged still, right? Hey, you're, you're living 114. I'm speaking out. I tell people all the time I'm living to be 100. They're like, are you training yeah. for something? Why do you eat all that green stuff? I was like, I'm going to be 100. That's, That's what I'm right. doing. That's exactly right. So, so what I'd love to do is fire away with a few, I'll, I'll call them, um, combative statements possibly so that we can educate each other and the listener because there's still a lot of this in the workforce. There's still a lot that's going on, even with all the work that y'all done and other people have done, there's still some going on. So is that okay? Can we play this game? Let's do it. I'm so excited. I doubt that there's anything that I haven't heard before. Yeah, I doubt it. I doubt it. Also, first of all, I, well, now let me, let me fire away. Then I'll back up because I, I was going to define what the millennials were. But, um, you know, that generation is just lazy. So how do you respond when someone my age calls your generation lazy? Yeah, it's, it's almost like saying that they're also unmotivated. Like I can't get them off the couch. I can't get them to do anything. But what I found is someone who appears lazy or unmotivated, it's not that they're, they lack motivation, it's that they lack direction. If you give that guy, that girl in my generation who appears to be unmotivated, something to do with their hands, something that they feel personally connected to, and yes, a purpose, you're going to see someone go from distracted, delays, that kind of person who procrastinates on everything, the re you're going to see that person go from such a negative self image to someone who's incredibly positive, very driven because they know that what they do matters. I think that's really the, the key to transform someone who lacks that motivation into someone who's a self motivation machine is knowing who they are and, and what they're doing. Yeah, that's good. How about uh, when I say they, they feel they're entitled Oh, that's the biggest one. I, I like to play word associations when I speak to conferences. Like what one word do you think of with millennials? And it's always entitled. And 
here's the thing with entitled. What we've actually found, I read a whole book about these called Five Millennial Myths, where I break down some of these these myths about millennials. And the first chapter is on entitlement because what we found was it wasn't that millennials are entitled. It was that it was ambition misdirected. Mm. We have a generation with incredible confidence who's very excited about being involved, being taken seriously, taking leadership at earlier ages, and has a very high self-confidence. So we're now coming into a workforce saying, hey, take us seriously. And that's incredible. Don't you want someone who is really self-confident, who wants to be involved? So I oftentimes will tell people, don't be concerned if millennials are asking why or asking questions. Start being concerned when they stop asking why or stop asking questions because they're probably looking for another job. Yeah, a follow-up to that would be being called spoiled or whatever. I think those are sort of related, but when I was brainstorming as much negative as I could, I said, oh, they're, they're kind of spoiled. And let me, let me just say, I, I should do this, but it's my podcast, so I'm not going to. But we could flip it around and let you hammer the, or the, the generation that work, work, work just to wear a badge that says I work the hardest and other things. So this is all can be flipped around, but right now you're, you're the one that has expertise. So, so you're the one on the hot seat. But um, what about when someone says you're spoiled, that the, the whole generation is spoiled? Yeah, I, I think, uh, well, why I wouldn't do that anyway, even if you, if you didn't want to, because uh, is I believe in, in honor and respect. I think it's something that isn't taught and isn't rewarded in society. And I think it's one of the things, whenever I'm speaking to, to students or working with universities, I'm always talking to students about respect because I think respect looks different for different generations. So for my generation, respect means I'm going to call you by your first name. I'm going to text you. We're going to hang out. You're like a peer or colleague. Respect for older generations is distance, whereas ours is closeness. So it's, I'm respected because I have a door to my office because you can't talk to me on weekends because you don't have my personal phone number. And so I think just the conversation around what respect looks like, like I've had clients call me and say, Gabrielle, what do I do? This millennial keeps coming to my office, putting their feet up, calling me by their first, my first name. What do I do? Like, that's awesome. <laughs> They're like, what do you mean? It's so disrespectful. They like you. They like right. you. <laughs> that's exactly, that's exactly right. So I, I think um, that was kind of the first part of your side question, but yeah. I, this idea that millennials are, are spoiled, I think that we, as a generation, we have had such well-intentioned parents and it really bothers me when people come out and start pointing fingers at parents, pa- parent, I'm not a parent, parenting is hard. Okay. You want to do, you're just talking about with your kids. You want to do the best. You would walk over hot coals for your kids to have a better opportunity for them. And so I I think blaming parents for spoiling or doing too much, every single parent, even if you don't have a lot to give, you're spoiling your kids. You want your kids to just be feel, feel so loved and so taken care of. And so I, I think our generation has a responsibility now. We're adults. We're not little kids anymore. I'm in my thirties now and I can't say, yeah, mom and dad did this to me. It's like, okay, great. Like I'm a big girl now, you know, I've got, you know, my own responsibilities. And I think that challenge for our generation to step up and quote unquote adult, which is like this new thing that millennials yeah, we never knew, talking we never about. Knew that, we never knew that word. It's like, I hear my daughter or someone say, yeah, we're, we're adulting. Oh, this is so adulting. I'm going, what does that mean? <laughs> I know. I'm like, so you're not, you know, wearing footy pajamas and, you know, wait, you know, I don't, I'm not quite sure what it means either, but I think it's, um, it's become this kind of cultural phenomena of appreciating when we're finally being responsible. Yeah. And, uh, and it's taken about seven years longer. So it's taking seven years longer for millennials to get married, have kids, buy a house. And so you just have to realize that millennials, if you're older and you're scratching your head saying, what is wrong with these kids? Just realize that we're a different generation raised with different priorities and a different economy and a different world. And just because it's different doesn't mean it's bad. And so what we teach all the time is what we call generational curiosity. Be curious. Just ask questions. Say, hey, you see the world differently than I do and open up a conversation rather than criticize someone because they don't see the world that the world the same way that you do. Yeah. There's a lot of negative things that are said. Listen, I, I actually think it's extremely damaging 
when a, let's call it a, what should be a more mature generation speaks poorly of another generation. And because this is kind of a spiritual belief that I have, I think that we look to the elder generation as kind of a model of what our relationship is with God, with the father. And so if they're trash talking us all the time, then, you know, I don't think that's a good model. And so anyway, it, so we hear things like they're destroying the world. They're a bunch of socialists, other things like that. I don't know that, I don't think I've said that. I may have, if I, if I do, I apologize. I've tried to apologize to my kids on that, but (laughs) what, what goes through your mind and I know you're not speaking for an entire generation, but what can go through someone in that age group's mind when they hear someone who's in a, a boomer or something like that saying stuff like that? I, I think whenever someone is critical of someone else, it just it shows that you're no longer empathetic towards them and you're no longer open to having a conversation. We're a generation that was raised from a very young age to talk about um, bullying, talk about um, diversity in a more unique way, talk about kind of our feelings. And older generations didn't have the platforms to do that. Um, they didn't have um, the same type of tools to be able to discuss it. It was, a, it was much more taboo then than it was now. Mm-hmm. And so I, I think that this generation is much more willing to have some of those difficult awkward and sometimes even, um, you know, uh, random conversations with our, with our parents, our our grandparents of people in our lives that again, see the, see the world in a, in a different way. And I think even just what was going on in society right now, I've seen so many young people just do such an incredible job of being, um, showing grace to their parents during this time where their generational perspective has caused them to see the world differently or, um, to not speak out in love and unintentionally say things that can can seem inappropriate. And, and I think that that's really um, one of the most important things that a younger generation needs to do. Yes, we any generation will model after whatever's being modeled for them. We all mirror what's modeled. So if you're going to, as a, as a parent, a grandparent, a leader, you're upset that a younger person in your life, a kid... Uh, and someone on your team who's younger than you, an employee, if they're not acting right, you need to start with yourself and recognize what am I modeling right now? If you want them to be more authentic, are you modeling authenticity? If you want them to be more virtuous, what virtues are you modeling? If you want them to be timely or appropriate, what are you modeling as well? As a leader, no matter your age, if you're 22 or 92, we all have a responsibility to be able to call out greatness in the people who, who are following us. And if you're 22 leading someone who's 92, the, the same onus is on, on you as well. Uh, leadership doesn't know age. It's all about how do you really take the time to get to know the people that you're influencing and take that responsibility secret, uh, seriously. Yeah, that's, that's great there. I love what you did. You actually flipped it around and you put the responsibility back on back on the leader or the individual, which leads great really well into my next question that I was going to ask. Maybe this, maybe you answered it, maybe not. I'll ask it this way. I'm, I was going to ask, what can we, our generation learn from you and your generation? And then the second part of that is what can you, your generation learn from us? And then we're going to move on to the purpose factor. Cool. So I'll start with what we can learn from you first. Mm -hmm. I think my generation can learn grit from older generations who were raised with a, um, a value set that was like, even if you don't like it, push through. And it's not about you. Even if you don't like the job, stick with it. Even if you don't, uh, like this part of the relationship, stick it out. You know, it was, a um, it was about perspective. And I think that that was a value that older generations were instilled at, a, at younger ages that my generation wasn't necessarily um, brought up with. We have, you know, raised in what I call the tinderbox, where literally we can just swipe left or right. We can decide whether or not we want to work somewhere and quit the next day, find another job by the afternoon. 
there is a, a low commitment threshold that my generation has come to accept as normal, which I think is detrimental to our relationships, to our community, to our economy. So I think that that's something that my generation can certainly learn from older generations who've kind of stuck with it. I think older generations, every older generation can learn the open-mindedness of a younger generation. When you're younger, it's so much easier to change your beliefs because you haven't held them as long. So you're like, well, I believe this for five years, must be wrong, versus I've learned something for 50 years. So it's what I call mental agility. When you're younger, it's easier to jump into that space where you ask questions, challenge your belief structures, say, is that right? Test it out, have a hypothesis, and here's a crazy idea, be okay that you're wrong. That's something that I think as a society, we don't have grace for people. We may accept an apology, but we still remember. So I think younger generations can really help older generations to accept that maybe what they believed about something wasn't accurate or is only a shade of the truth and, uh, and show that there's a, a power of perspective that comes when you have that mental agility. Yeah, that's good. I actually heard someone recently, they might have defined in a different way, but they said one of the key things for future, future us, is adaptability, which in some ways is a cousin or related to that mental agility, and that is being able to be adaptable and flexible. And dang, wouldn't the world be so much better right now if more people were just a little bit more flexible? That would be awesome. Mm -hmm. Well, let's move into, I, I want to talk about purpose and I want to try to get as much of this out of you in the time we have so that we can understand this and, and, and we'll talk about when the book's going to be released and so that people can get it. But, uh, but when I went and checked it out, boy, there was a list of people. So do you know The Rock? <laughs> Yeah, we've got some pretty crazy wow. endorsements like The Rock, like Tony Dungy and Tim Tebow and Brian Tracy. And um, I mean, Tim, you get this. It's it's pretty incredible when you see so many A-list celebrities like Rachel Hollis and Lewis Howes and stuff coming around uh, a book and a concept that's all about the importance of finding purpose. Mm. And, uh, and I think a big part of that is, is that we've moved away from kind of the shared economy and from this idea of, you know, creating something that makes sense for me into the purpose economy, which it's all about finding purpose and using purpose. Universities are recruiting on find your purpose. Uh, companies are recruiting and retaining people all around purpose. Um, brands are selling all about purpose. And, and I think that there's been such an incredible reset that we're in the middle of right now that's really focusing people on those big life questions. It's who am I, why do I matter, and what am I supposed to do? Yeah, and that word you brought up, reset, to me is the word that's just been rolling around with all that's going on right now. And talk about the timing for, number one, the book being released, and number two, the listener that's sitting here going, that sounds kind of cool. Is this a good time? Just talk about timing for a moment. Yeah, I think timing is something that I think a lot of folks are thinking more about because we're recognizing time is going really fast and really slow at the same time. Yeah. So you've got this kind of accelerated stillness of there's this in-between where it's kind of the first month of folks working from home, everyone was like batting down the hatches, like what's going on? Like you over there, you over here. And it was, it was how, do we, how do we survive? And then now we've started to recognize that, you know, the internet still works. We can all still communicate and work from home. It's taken some adjustment, um, but it's, it really um, is extremely, extremely doable. The, what I've started to find in some of this, this white space of, of people being home, they're asking these bigger questions. Like, okay, I've committed myself to this particular career, but is it really what makes me happy? Or yeah, I, I've been thinking about doing a podcast or writing a book or trying to figure out what to do next, but is that the right next move? And I think in the busyness of the day, of the constant crazy cycle of checking things off of our to-do list, 
we stop asking is what I'm doing, what I'm supposed to be doing. And so that's really the, the role of, of this book, The Purpose Factor, is how do you discover your purpose, your exact purpose, what you're created to do, and how do you apply it into every aspect of your life, your relationships, your job, your income, your dreams, your hobbies. How do you make sure that you start with the right things in place rather than starting at, uh, starting at step seven, start at step one. Who are you and what are you supposed to do? What do you have to bring to the world and let everything else fall in place? So, so it's a good time to do that right now, correct? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I, I love the thought. And this goes back to something you said right when we got started was that you and Brian made the decision that you were going to, I think the word you use, you were going to use this time for value, for growth. And I might be changing the words a little bit, but that, that to me is very powerful. I, I think that there's still a lot of change that's in our future. And, and one of the things that I thought of when you were talking about that was, you know, a lot of people that have you used the term white space, which is really cool, free time. You know, their, their time's not totally booked up. Their work from home. And they may have realized that some of the things that cause them to go into work or do what they did were more superficial. Like they just loved a couple of the people they hung out with. Well, you don't get to hang out with them now. Yeah. So let's ask ourselves some questions. So tell us about the book. Tell us about the formation of it. And I'm probably going to ask you a few questions as we go over here the last few minutes of the podcast, but, um, but, but give it, give it to us. Tell us about the purpose factor, extreme clarity. Yep. So we, we, uh, Brian is my husband and my co-author. So this is our second book that we've written together. So our sixth book collectively that we've written. And uh, we, this process started about seven years ago where both of us were independently looking for our purpose. This was right before we had met each other. And Brian had um, experienced a divorce and a layoff in the same months. He was kind of at the bottom trying to figure out what in the world was he going to do with his life. I was, had just moved across the country. I knew no one. I was doing what I thought I was supposed to be doing, which was continuing to get more and more degrees, get more and more in debt, yeah. thinking that that was going to not only make me happy, but um, uh, a appeal to my overachiever, achievement addicted heart. So I, I found myself really frustrated that I felt like I was doing everything I was supposed to do and I wasn't really fulfilled at the end of the day. So Brian had one of these moments where he was, he had moved to Florida, he took an all commission sales job, and he was trying to sell this woman a self-help product, ironically, and he is trying to sell this product, and she literally interrupts him, and she says, I can't buy anything from you, I don't even know my purpose, and it hit him, it's like, I don't know my purpose, and here's this woman, she doesn't know her purpose, is there a process to find purpose? Like everyone kept telling us in our 20s, find your purpose, find your purpose. And like there's a, a, a system to pay off your debt. There's a system to start a business. There's, there's systems for all of these really important things in our life. Shouldn't there be a system to find your purpose? And so he started discovering and kind of developing the system even before we met. We met, I'd started my company, The Millennial Solution at the time, and I had one of those moments where I was like, what am I supposed to do? I had a chance encounter with someone at a conference where he asked me a question. He said, what one word makes you smile? Without thinking, I was like, generations. What a, what a weird thing to say. Um, but I, I kind of knew right then in that moment that I, I was really passionate about something, but I had no idea what to do. And uh, so fast forward a couple months, went home, ended up writing a, a book, Five Millennial Myths, and then ultimately starting my company. And Brian and I came together and we discovered that the reason that both he and I had clarity was because we had done the hard work of discovering our purpose. Mm -hmm. Like, is there a way to break something down in a very systematic way? It's four simple steps to be able to discover your purpose and three even more simple steps to apply it to make sure that people aren't spending their time, their effort, their intention, their, their skills in, a, in an area or in a direction that isn't aligned with what God's called them to do. 
Mm, excellent. So that led, sounds like that it wasn't totally overnight that that's been a process for almost seven years, correct? Oh yeah, a process, that is for sure. It was, uh, I went from stuff being scribbled down on legal pads to um, being down on those giant white sticky notes to we had painted in our kitchen the entire thing with blackboard paint so we could write everything down and started inviting friends over and testing it on them. So it started extremely organically and made its way all the way up to the top of working with the U.S. military in these more major uh, Fortune 500 brands. So it's had humble beginnings, but has had a global impact. And so, and so you guys, you have the book and you also have the company and, and talk to me, you mentioned a few just now, but who would be a client for the company? And then we'll, we'll mention the book here as we finish up here over the last few minutes and tell people, obviously everyone should get the book, but who's, who's an ideal client for you? For yep. the purpose company. So we help achiever types who feel kind of stuck in place, who are looking for that clarity, understand exact clarity about their purpose and how they can apply it to the next decision that they need to make. So we help individuals, authors, entrepreneurs, business leaders who just need to get extreme clarity about their purpose in life and what they're supposed to do next. We also help companies who are in a position where they recognize that the role of purpose is really powerful to attract, retain, and engage their employees. And so we do leadership development training for companies who recognize that if they can get their employees to discover their purpose, they can not only increase their output, their productivity, and their engagement, but create a culture that's absolutely incredible. So we've helped companies increase their productivity by over 70%. We've seen them go from number 250 to number five in the nation when it comes to customer service. We've seen complete culture shifts, all because people are now not only talking about purpose, but have a system to be able to help their employees find their purpose and apply it to what they do every day. Okay, so, so here's what I'm going to ask. I'm going to ask you to give away a little bit and, and talk to me about, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come to you as a as, uh, a self-proclaimed achiever type that you mentioned earlier, which I just happen to be an author. I just finished my first novel and Oh my and goodness. Congratulations. Podcast, <laughs> business coach, all that kind of stuff. Don't don't just cause I live in an RV. Don't judge me. Okay. I don't think you would, but anyway, so, um, so what would be some of the first steps? Walk me through. I, first of all, I'm guessing I have to raise my hand and say, I need something different. I need to live differently. I need purpose or, or, or whatever. What would, what would be some of the things I would be saying? But, and, I'm, and I'm trying to actually ask questions for the listener. For the listener mm -hmm. here that might be going, gosh, I wonder if that's me or not me. And then what would be some of the first things you would do with me as either a client or, or someone that you might work with? Sure. So two things I think really determine whether or not someone is ready for change. Number one, you have to be uncomfortable with your current situation. So that means that you have to realize that what is working out right now is not going to work out for the long term. And if you were to wake up in 12 months or 12 years and be stuck in the same exact position you are right now, you would go crazy. You'd be disappointed. You'd be frustrated. You would be very just um, overwhelmed with, with regret. So number one, you have to be uncomfortable with your current situation. Number two, you have to be hungry. You have to know that you want more, that there's more out there. I have a number of folks who will contact us. They want to work with us. So like, I'm really uncomfortable. I'm unhappy, but they're not hungry. They don't think that I actually can do it. Maybe it's a past failure. Or maybe it's something that they experienced in the past. Maybe they think they're too old or too young or too poor, or too rich or whatever to make any sort of move. So you have to be hungry enough to say, I know that I'm made for more and I'm going to do whatever it takes to be able to go from where, where I am to where I need to be. Right. So, so do you see a lot of people, and again, this is a percentage earlier, you told me 95% and 5%, but do you see a lot of people that they hope for more? but they just aren't willing to step over that threshold of those criteria you just mentioned? Or have you guys positioned yourself so well that by the time someone kind of gets to you, 
they're ready. Can you give a contrast yeah. between two? I'm just curious. And one of the reasons why I'm doing it, I'll go ahead and share this. I am attempting to get a pulse on society hmm. because in many ways, this actually could be a generational thing. I'm concerned about what I'm seeing going on in the world. And if I hear people speaking like you, I'm going, yes, we're going to be okay. If there's X number of people that think that way, how, how, how many people do you see that can walk over that threshold? Yeah, I think it's really interesting that you're talking about hope. I think hope is powerful, but I also call, I also call it a hopioid. We are so addicted to hope. Like, I hope that he changes. I hope that they pay me what I feel like I deserve. I hope that the economy inc improves. I hope I don't get sick. I hope I get better. I mean, there are so many wishes and hopes that we cross our fingers or put, you know, put in our prayer jar that something's going to change without realizing that we're fully equipped, fully responsible, and fully capable of doing things ourselves. And so I think that's really one of the key differentiators between people who remove themselves from the 95% of people who don't know their purpose and start entering into that small elite group of people who know their purpose and that even smaller group who are applying it to find maximum fulfillment. I don't believe that you can feel fulfilled without knowing your purpose. Because we define purpose as what you have inside of you to help other people. And fulfillment is a result of using what you have to help others. They're completely counterdependent. And so someone may say, oh, I find fulfillment in my, you know, in what I do for volunteering or in what I do for my kids or in my hobbies. But that is just a brief glimpse. That's just enjoyment. That's not fulfillment. We're designed to create things, to have a stake in things, to see things out. If I ask you, you know, what's the most fulfilled day of your life other than the birth of your children, it's probably something that you worked really hard for, that you had that grittiness factor, that you were like, I know I was not only dedicated, but I was applying things that I'm good at, things I had to discover. Every element of my being was lit up like a Christmas tree. That's my goal is what this book does is spark a movement of purpose where people recognize that life is too short, the world is too big, and there are problems everywhere to solve. And it's your role, responsibility, and opportunity to discover your purpose and apply it to solving some of life's biggest problems. Yeah. So nobody can do it for us. We have to do it on our own. <laughs> it turns out. Yeah. And, and you can't wait for permission from someone else to say, Tim, you can go find your purpose. You, you can go use it. And I think that's a huge challenge that people have is they think someone's going to come around like the purpose fairy and say, now you're magically allowed to do it. They're not coming. And so every time we wait for someone to give us permission, we're putting our purpose in someone else's hands. And that's not how it works. No one's going to care or defend or work for your purpose like you will. So yes, it's your responsibility to find it and your responsibility to use it. Yeah, there's another P word that's thrown around a good bit and that word's passion. And so what I'd love for you, for you to do, this is kind of like one of our first wrap up questions. I, I may have a couple wrap up. I'm sort of like Elvis or Bruce Springsteen or someone where we're doing a couple of uh, encores here. Talk about the difference or similarities between passion and purpose, because I, I hear that word thrown around a lot in the circles that I run in. And I sometimes wonder if people get confused by the two. Of course they do. Yeah. If you actually look at the dictionary definition of passion, Oxford defines passion as a barely controllable emotion. Oh. And yet we tell students, follow your passion. Like that is the worst advice you can give someone who's a teenager is to go follow their barely controllable emotion. Like that's what they're dealing with all day long. But we as a society tell people only do things if you're passionate about it, or, you know, I, I just stopped doing that. It wasn't my passion or I'm passionate about coffee or travel or pugs or whatever it is, but you're literally just saying it's something I like. And so you cannot create an entire life around things that you like or you enjoy because that is just a brief moment of time that you maybe are enjoying this sandwich or, you know, looking at a beautiful view. Passion, actually the secondary definition has to do with the suffering of Christ. And so what we tell people is it's not really a passion unless you're willing to sacrifice for it. 
that is the ultimate definition of what something is a passion. And so as we help people find their purpose, there's four elements. One of them is what we call pull passion. Pull passion is something that pulls you. It's a problem in the world that you want to solve that you're willing to sacrifice for. And so as we teach purpose to adults, to students, to people who are in transition, trying to figure out what's next, one of our core questions we ask people is, what are you willing to sacrifice for? That you're willing to give up your recognition, your income, your stability to be able to go out there and solve. Because that's a much better thermometer of what you're passionate about versus something you just enjoy doing on the weekends. Yeah, so there's a word, there was a word that jumped out at me and the word is energy. And then, and then you went sacrifice, and then you mentioned sacrifice and another thing started spinning around. But so before I, I leave the word energy, though, I want to ask when you are walking in your purpose, I use the word assignment a lot. So I don't, they're probably related, but when you're walking in that, should you have energy? Should you be drained? Is there a difference? Because many times I will say that what, what you're involved with that pull passion is most likely going to stir you in some way. Am I correct or incorrect? I'm okay with you correcting me too, by the no, way. No, I could not agree more. And it's, it's, uh, we call it the oxygen mass principle. So you have to help yourself first before you help someone else. So right. just as you know, they instruct you when you're flying on planes, which most of us aren't doing these days, yeah. you have to put the oxygen mask on yourself first before you can go and help other people. But unfortunately, I think in a society of people who are leaders and servers and givers, we almost wear it as a badge of honor that we're exhausted, that we're tired. Oh, I've given up so much. Or, oh, I've gained 50 pounds after having my kids. Or, oh, you know, I'm you know, so exhausted on the weekends because I'm just giving and giving and giving. Well, that's not what we're called to do. We're not called to be dish rags. We're called to use what we have to help other people. And that should energize you. And so if you're getting to the end of the day and you feel more drained than fulfilled, I would question and challenge you about whether or not you really are walking in that purpose. Because there's nothing more exciting than, for me, helping other people discover their purpose. Like, it's six in the morning, I'm doing it. I've got to call at nine o'clock tonight, I'm going to do it. I'm, I'm constantly addicted to this feeling of using what I have to help other people. So maybe yours isn't finding purpose. Maybe it's helping someone recover from addiction or helping someone, you know, find their first home or their forever home, you, whatever it is. There's so many core elements that when you find that energizing factor, that's really one of the, um, one of the really important parts to pay attention to because where you get energy, that's really where you start to see some of these core elements starting to flicker. Any other, any other clues that you're close. I guess one of the things I'm intrigued by, this probably is my last question, maybe. One of the things I'm intrigued by is, is it possible that someone could be all over their purpose, maybe without knowing it, but they're energized? I guess I'm trying to think of some people that I've interacted with that they may be near it or all over it or walking in that purpose but not know what would be some other clues that someone say might, you know what, I may not be that far off. Yeah. Anything else that you. Yeah. There's so, I think many people assume that finding your purpose means that you have to change everything completely. You have to move across the country. You have to change your hair, change your relationships, change your job, but that's not true. Purpose is vocation agnostic. You can take it with you when you go to school, when you get married, when you have kids, when you live switch in an RV. jobs, can you live in an when RV? You, you can live in an RV and still <laughs> use your purpose. So your purpose is not tethered to your vocation of what you do for a living. Your purpose is what you have inside of you to, to help other people. And so when you start to recognize that it was there all along, I was uh, working with uh, one of our clients who is a, is a doctor. And he had these big dreams and was like, yeah, I get what I'm doing, but you know, I, I really want to go and do this thing over here. And he wanted to start a nonprofit or a company or this or that or speak, or right? And then we helped him discover his purpose and how he's applying it right now. And he recognized, he called us a week later and he said, I can't believe it. It's been here all along. It's like, I recognize that these core elements of my purpose, I'm using them every day in front of my patients. And what an incredible responsibility I have. 
And so it's not the responsibility you have to start something halfway across the globe. For him, it was recognizing what was in his hands all along. And so there are many people maybe listening to this podcast that are so close, but the reason that they're lacking fulfillment or wanting to chase after shiny objects of the next thing, what's exciting, fun, trendy, is because they haven't done the hard work to discover their purpose, to get perspective on what they're currently doing. Yeah, that's good. I have one more last question. Good. <laughs> First of all, I want to I want to acknowledge my guess is is when you have situations like the doctor you just mentioned that that gives you and Brian great fulfillment and joy because it seems as if that's what you're created and purpose for. Would I would that be correct? Absolutely. It's an incredible experience to be able to get, have those ahas where people recognize who they are and what they have to help other people. Right. Okay. So in the culture that we're in, it is so easy currently, and it's probably going to continue this way for us to compare ourselves with others. How detrimental is that when people begin this process of identifying what their unique, from their creation, from the beginning of time purpose is, I run across a number of people that they're attempting to live someone else's purpose. Oh yeah. And so how critical is it to identify your purpose? And mm -hmm. I'm talking about the person listening almost, I'm going to ask you to speak to the person that is probably living or trying to fulfill that through someone else's purpose. Yep. Yeah. Living someone else's purpose is like wearing someone else's shoes. Like it might look cute for a while, but eventually it's going to start to smell. Hmm. So I think as a society, we all suffer from constant comparison where we're looking to the left or the right, comparing jobs, houses, wives, opportunities, incomes, whatever it is. And it's really all just the perception of someone else's purpose. And so you're never going to feel fully fulfilled if you are living in the shadow of what you're perceiving someone else's purpose is, because purpose is completely unique to you. One of the core elements of purpose is what we call origin story. And it's what you've overcome in those formative years. Everyone's overcome something or is overcoming something. And so when we help people identify that origin story, it's like this powerful permission piece comes together where they recognize, oh my goodness, I have permission to be able to help these people or do this thing, or now I have so much more clarity. An origin story is completely unique to you. You may have someone who has the same skills as you, who has the same abilities as you, who can check off the boxes on a resume or job application like you, but no one has the experiences that you do. No one has that overcomer spirit like you do. And so when you really go deep to recognize who you are and what you were created to, to do, those problems you were created to solve, everything else starts to, starts to fall in place. And so if you're suffering from that constant comparison, wondering if, am I enough? Or what if I try what this other person's doing? It's never going to work. It's never going to fit because it was not created for you. So take the time to discover that origin story element to really go deep to understand who you are. That is cool. That's very exciting for me. We actually did a podcast episode called The Origin Story of how we came up with our name. And how cool. You know, it had some, some components of my purpose and things like that. So well, I'm a, I'm a big uh, Marvel nerd, so I had to definitely put in, um, put in some kind of origin story comic book stuff, which Brian is not the nerd in the relationship. I definitely am. So he, uh, he let me have a, a couple of plays in there. So the, the book is pretty hilarious um, because we put in a lot of personality, a lot of our own personal stories, the things that we've overcome. We get really gritty and raw. But um, but we definitely wanted to make sure people had fun reading it, too. That's excellent. So, uh, Gabrielle, how can people connect with you and go ahead and give us, we'll put it in all the notes, but uh, go ahead and tell us how they can find the book. And I think it's being released in September. Did I read that correctly? So, yep. so the podcast will probably air by then. And obviously, people may be watching on Facebook and other ways. But go ahead and give us all the ways that people can get in touch with you and Brian. 
Sure. So they can check out the book at purposefactorbook.com. And uh, you can learn more about us at brianandgab.com and uh, learn about what we're doing, um, what we speak on, who we're helping, and be able to follow us there. Excellent. And people can get the book probably when it releases in all places, but they can go obviously directly to your site and get it there too. Absolutely. Yeah. So you can go ahead and pre-order at purposefactorbook.com. That's the, that's the way to go. Yes. You want it pre-ordered because that's a big help. So good job. Yeah. And I, I recommend it. Listen, this, this is something that everyone needs. This is a key for it. Kind of like I said earlier for, a higher percentage of people in our culture and society to understand what their purpose is. And so I appreciate, I appreciate the journey y'all have been on. I appreciate the fact that y'all have captured this, uh, this formula and this, this factor. So thank you. Thank you for doing that. What is next? I mean, we know we've got the book, we've got this coming up. And I kind of joke, what's next, either dinner, lunch, or this weekend, or 30 years? What's, what's next for you? And I don't know if you can answer for Brian, but what's next? Yeah, well, next, next is uh, going to the gym right after this. Uh, but I think kind of the, the big next for us is, you know, partnering up with people who are excited about what we call the purpose economy and really changing the way that we talk about purpose, the way that we talk about opportunity, the way that we talk about success. And, and I think back to that timing thing that you mentioned, I think that there's just this incredible timing mm -hmm. happening where people are having deeper conversations. And so it's really our, our hope and our prayer that the purpose factor process becomes a core tool to help people in this kind of transition towards a more purpose centered economy. Yeah, that's excellent. Gabrielle, the title of this podcast is Seek, Go, Create. We always like to ask, which one of those words resonates with you and why? Yeah, I love that question. I That's incredible because I, I was really drawn to the title of your podcast too. I was like, that's incredible. Uh, seek, for sure. If you, if you don't look inward and upward, then you don't know where you're going. So I'm all about, I'm an origin girl. So start at the beginning, know who you are, know where you're going. So that way you have a, the right, as my mom used to say, the right arrows on your tennis shoes. So you, you know, you're heading in the right direction. Wow. I have so enjoyed this conversation. Gabrielle, thank you for joining us on the podcast. I really appreciate you taking the time to talk with us. If you would like to continue the conversation, I encourage you to do that. We encourage that. We welcome that. We are hopeful that you do that. Go to seekgocreate.com to comment on the episode post, or you can contact us there. That's seekgocreate.com. You can also find us and communicate on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Instagram. All of those, we are Seek Go Create. Thank you again for joining us. We look forward to connecting with you on the Seek Go Create podcast in the near future.